Good evening. I think this is the noisiest crowd I've ever uh, uh, Welcome to the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero. I am the Archivist of the United States. And next year, I will be marking my first year as the 10th Archivist of the United States. So welcome to my house. Tonight marks the sixth annual McGowan Forum on Communications. This annual event was established to honor an innovator and revolutionary whose pioneering work helped ignite a telecommunications revolution that affects us in many ways every day. Bill McGowan challenged what was called the phone company, a monopoly, and that challenge helped lead to the breakup of AT&T. This breakup unleashed decades of competition, innovation and invention, and expanded use of rapid and inexpensive means of communication. Bill's legacy is very much alive here at the National Archives in this theater, which bears his name. And every day, the archives reaches millions of people with the communications tools and technologies that trace their lineage to the revolution he ignited with MCI Communications. This theater, dedicated in 2004, was made possible by a very generous gift from the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. The theater is a major component of our National Archives experience, which brings over one million visitors each year to view our exhibitions and the Charters of Freedom. Since this theater opened, we have hosted symposia on policy and public affairs issues, previews of books by famous authors, and many film programs. Notice, noted historians, Supreme Court justices, policymakers, and many other notables have graced this stage. And many of these events are televised nationwide on C-SPAN. The Charles Guggenheim Center for Documentary Film uses this theater as its venue, and each year we screen the Academy Award nominees for documentaries and short subjects. Every day, our public visitors come to see the orientation film on the archives, Democracy Starts Here, before moving on to other exhibits upstairs. The McGowan Theater helps us add value to our exhibits. For example, two upcoming events will complement our exhibit, Discovering the Civil War. This coming Wednesday, when part two of our Civil War exhibit opens, we will show the 1927 classic Buster Keaton film, The General, which is set during the Civil War. It begins at 7 p.m. and is open to the public. And then on November 20th, we'll host here a day-long symposium, The Civil War Fresh Perspectives, featuring three panel discussions and 15 authors, professors, and historians. It runs from 9 to 5, and you need to register on our website at archives.gov. Tonight, we will see the story of how this young man from Pennsylvania, the son of a railroad engineer and a school teacher, took a small telecommunications company, grew it, brought down AT&T's monopoly, and helped unleash a revolution in telecommunications. I'd like to introduce Bill McGowan's wife, Su Jin McGowan. She is president and director of the Su Ling Jin Charitable Fund and president of the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. She is also co-founder and CEO of Chicago-based Flying Food Group, which provides passenger meals to airlines, and she is founder and president of New Management Limited, a successful real estate leasing management development firm in Chicago. She serves on a number of boards and cor of corporate, cultural, and educational organizations, and earlier this year, I'm proud to say, was named to the board of the Foundation for the National Archives. I'd like to thank you, Sue Jin, and, William, and the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund for the generous support of the McGowan Forum on Communications for the past six years and for making possible this theater, which in turn has made possible so much else here at the archives. Please welcome Sue Jin McGowan. Welcome to the annual meeting of MCI. <laughs> okay. Welcome to what is officially the sixth annual William G. McGowan Forum on Communications, Technology, and Government. Seven years ago, the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund partnered with the National Archives to develop this theater right here in the nation's capital. Bill McGowan, my late husband, would be overjoyed that a theater created in his memory is now a popular setting 
for public screenings of outstanding documentaries, and for lively national conversations about time-relevant or timely topics. Bill loved to talk. He loved history. He loved the movies. He loved debating the great ideas of the day. Once the theater was completed, the McGowan Fund established an annual fall forum to examine key topics in commerce, technology, and government. Later, we added an annual spring forum to spotlight women in leadership. Last year, our fall forum was Web 2.0, Technologies and Participatory Democracy. The program delighted a capacity audience with presentations by savvy panels of experts. But this year is unique. We are screening Long Distant Warrior, which eloquently details Bill's life and the story of MCI's climb to an open marketplace. The film is the creation of two superb filmmakers, Sarah Holt of Holt Productions and Bester Cram of North Lights Productions. The Hagley Museum, holder of the MCI archives, has generously sponsored the film. A few years ago, utilizing a grant, the McGowan Fund, the, William, uh, the Willing, Wilmington, Delaware-based Hagley, established a digital library and archives detailing Bill's role in telecommunications history. The Hagley McGowan Collection remains a lasting resource for students and others interested in knowing more about Bill's contribution. I believe Bill McGowan proved to us all that nothing is impossible and that a crisis is just another opportunity. After spending almost a decade doggedly seeking the breakup of AT&T's national monopoly on US phone service, Bill helped usher in today's advances in global telecommunications technology. There is perfect synergy in having the William McGowan Forum on Communication screen long distance warrior right here at the McGowan Theater at the National Archives, the center point of democracy. Bill's story is about democracy. It's about the rule of law and open competition. It's about overcoming special interests that tried to block progress and, pres and preserve privilege. Ours would be a very different world if Bill McGowan had not been a part of it. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce William E. Conway, Jr., a founding partner and managing director of the Carlisle Group, a private equity firm based in Washington, just across the street. Before forming Carlisle in 1987, Bill spent three years as a senior vice president and chief financial officer of MCI Communications. He was a vice president and treasurer of MCI from 1981 to 1984. During his time at MCI, he arranged several billion dollars of debt and equity financing, both on the public and private financial markets, and negotiated MCI's most significant acquisitions and divestitures. To introduce our program tonight, please welcome Bill Conway. Thank you, uh, David. I'm honored tonight to introduce a film about my friend, mentor, and colleague. Without question, Bill McGowan was one of the most influential businessmen of his or, frankly, any era. He was the long-distance warrior, the man who took on the most powerful monopoly of his time, AT&T, and in the process created a whole new industry. Bill did not accept the world as it is, and so he changed it. Of course, my knowledge of Bill comes from my own personal experience working side by side with him, and what made him so special to me is probably different than what made him special to many of you. We all have our own Bill McGowan stories, and I'm not going to regale you with some of the racier ones right now. 
as David said, I first met Bill in 1974. I was a young loan officer at the First National Bank of Chicago, and First Chicago was the lead bank for MCI. And the bank thought they had a secured loan, and it turned out to be a venture capital investment. The company's revenues were under a million dollars. And in fact, in 1975, MCI did a public offering raising $8.5 million, selling about 10% of the company. I joined MCI in 1981 as the treasurer when its revenues were about 100 million. I became chief financial officer in 1984, and I left in 1987 when its revenues were about $4 billion. And there is no connection between what I did and all that, all that MCI growth. Uh, many of us have fond memories of Bill. For me, he had four unique qualities. First, he was determined. Uh, you can only change the world if it's a personal imperative, not just because you think it's a good idea. And for Bill, it was, it was a personal imperative. Second, he had vision. I can remember him telling me that he made decisions about what to do today by putting himself out five years in the future and then looking back on today from that improved perspective and figuring out with better information what he really ought to do. Think of the vision required to turn an unconstructed dream of a microwave system between Chicago and St. Louis into a multi-billion dollar global communications company. Bill's third great character trait, in my opinion, was that he worked on what was important. Whether the most important skill at any particular time in MCI's history was sales or regulatory or operations or finance or microwave technology or antitrust law, Bill became a self-taught PhD in that domain. And finally, Bill had a fabulous sense of humor. Here's one of my favorite stories. In 1985, we're at the New York Society of Security Analysts, an audience of hundreds of stockbrokers and analysts and investment managers, you know, probably 10 times as many people as are here. And the two of us are sitting up on the dais alone looking out into this crowd in the dark. I'd been MCI's CFO for a very short time. Bill's role was to tell the MCI story, and my role was to talk about the numbers. So an, uh, you can imagine what's coming. So an analyst asked Bill a question about the earnings a couple of years down the road. And Bill's overly optimistic reply clearly had a few too many zeros in it. <laughs> I was trying to hide under the speaker's table, and then the same analyst asked this immediate, disbelieving follow-up question Challenging Bill's numbers, Bill merely said, well, a dollar isn't worth what it used to be. <laughs> the crowd roared with laughter, and he turned the podium over to me. <laughs> it, you know, it's great to see so many of my old MCI friends here tonight, those of you that I can recognize. <laughs> and that isn't everybody, to be honest. Um, I have to tell you in advance what you will not see in the film. And what you will not see in the film is yourselves. I kept looking for Carl Vorderbrugge or Ken Cox or Tom Lemming or Bill Zlotnick or Wayne English or Jim Hader or Goldie or lots of other people. You aren't there. Despite all of your great contributions to MCI, and by the way, I apologize for all those people whose names I didn't put in that litany of, of names, but you weren't there either. <laughs> Despite all your great contributions, you aren't in that movie. This is a movie about Bill, the long distance warrior. However, in many ways, you are there. You're there behind Bill, even if not on the screen. Because in addition to the legacy of a changed global communications world, I believe that we, are all Bill's other legacy. Without him, we wouldn't be who we are today. Enjoy the movie.
Hi, everyone there. I'm Thoda Klo. I'm the executive director of the Foundation for the National Archives. And I want to first say, we didn't see many times that that man smiled on this film, but man, when he smiled, what a beautiful face. And I would always want him to smile at me. That's all I'm saying. Also, um, we at the National Archives believes that everybody, if you search hard enough, has a personal connection through the records of the National Archives. And you will actually find Bill McGowan's uh, records from the National Archives in a case that we have dedicated to him outside the theater. So if you're interested, take a peek at that as well. Um, um, all I am is the transition team tonight, so don't worry about me being up here too long. Um, I'm up on the stage to welcome our speakers for tonight's programs, and you already have bios in your uh, program tonight. So first of all, we have representing some more personal insights to these moments in history, and we have John Worthington, as well as uh, representing the film production side of our program, the producers and directors of tonight's film, both Sarah Holt and Bester Cram, who are personal friends of the National Archives because they've done wonderful, wonderful film work for us. So John, I think we're welcoming you first. There you are, I recognize you. <laughs> Thank you, and good evening. Was that a tribute, or was it a tribute? You bet. <laughs> really great work. Long distance warrior captured Bill's spirit. He was competitive. He was intensely competitive. He was unremittingly competitive. He, he would never say uncle, and winning was the only important thing. And yet, at the same time, Bill was scrupulously honest and ethical. And that's a rare combination. Uh, but a combination that is one that we at the fund would like to perpetuate. And for that reason, uh, we are proposing to launch tomorrow an ongoing forum to promote the benefits of ethical conduct in business, in all aspects of business. But back to the film, it portrayed Bill's importance to MCI and its successes, and to the telecommunications industry, and to the emergency, emergency uh, information services as well. But the film also did something just as important. It demonstrated Bill's place in the minds and hearts of all of us here who are proud, very proud, to be MCIers. Thank you. Now I'd like to call up to the here a uh, Sarah Holt and Buster Cram to receive a well-deserved round of applause. This has been a privilege for both of us to be a part of this uh, story, uh, to find ways in which we could make connections to somebody that we did not know, uh, and to learn uh, that uh, we missed out in not knowing him. Uh, when you're a filmmaker, you begin to identify with your subject. And I have to tell you, I would practice in the morning. I'm going to borrow some more money. I really want to borrow some more money. We can do this. And it was uh, with that kind of spirit that uh, Bill McGowan began to enter into our lives in a way that uh, was unexpected. 
I can say that we never have ever done films where somebody has been so universally loved, maybe not by everybody at AT&T, <laughs> but all of the people that we had contact with, many of you are here tonight, <clears throat> we would press hard, tell us something about Bill that just would possibly push us to a different edge of conflict. And of course, there was much conflict that was part of the whole story, but it was always a universal response. Just as you have said, John, the man was filled with energy, he was filled with entrepreneurial spirit, he was filled with honesty. And so it was a great privilege for us to be able to be a part of telling that story. Now, as a co-producer, I have to tell you that <clears throat> it was also a privilege for me to work with the person who really crafted the story, Sarah Holt. Oh, well, thank you. Well, first, I would just like to thank the many people in this room that helped us make this film. The family members, the friends, the Hagley Museum that funded it. Um, without your photos, your stories, the, great, the people that gave us great interviews. Um, but I'd also like to thank Bill McGowan because for a filmmaker, a great story is a gift. And I just hope we did it justice.